I'm Lauren Kurtz. I'm the director of the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund, and we help scientists who are being attacked through litigation mechanisms um, by parties who don't believe in their scientific findings, um, you know, for political or other reasons, people who want to attack climate scientists. Right. So, Lauren, we've had a recent court decision that is significant for climate yes. science. Uh, yes, can just yes. give us a, a rundown. So, last month, uh, we had a great decision in Arizona. There is a group called uh, Energy and Environment Legal, or e and &E Legal for short, and they have made it their mission to go after climate scientists' personal records. They argue that uh, state open records laws um, classify, you know, government-funded or public university scientists as public servants under the uh, umbrage of these laws, and they say that the scientists are then obligated to turn over all their documents the same way that, um, you know, a government uh, accountant has to turn over the minutes of a financial meeting. We've been adding a new practice, which is taking a page from the environmental movement's playbook which is using open records laws as well to do what our Supreme Court in the United States once wrote in an opinion. Find out what your government is up to because we believe markets make better decisions with better information and more information so we try to obtain. What are they saying to each other, the agencies, the regulators? What are they saying as they work and often collude with pressure groups so they went after two climate scientists at the University of Arizona and said, you need to give us all your emails. Um, I mean, it, it specified specific people and specific parties, but basically emails going back to the late 90s. Um, this was a huge burden on the scientists. In fact, one of them told me it took him 10 plus weeks just to even find all these emails and look at them. Uh, but the University of Arizona contested this and said we shouldn't have to turn them over because this is really just a form of harassment. You're looking for something to um, take out of context. This is a group um, that has unfortunately gone after other climate scientists in the past, uh, Michael Mann being the big example. My objective would be for every group in the freedom, the liberty movement to have somebody dedicated to thinking about what information should we ask for, to being trained in how to ask for it properly, to narrowly tailor it. Uh, to choose the right verbiage, the right windows of time, to, to how to look for the records, or how to go fishing, which is permitted under these laws. In any case, the, uh, the court upheld the University of Arizona's decision, and they said this is entirely justified, and we support the University of Arizona in declining to release the climate scientist emails. So that's fantastic. Wow. Okay. So is, is that the final word? Did the bad guys just go away? <laughs> No, unfortunately, um, because their mission really does seem to be to harass climate scientists, they have appealed. They just filed a notice of appeal last week. So they haven't actually submitted the documentation for the appeal, um, but that will be forthcoming shortly, and we'll see what they have to say, and this will go to the Court of Appeals in Arizona. Um, right now, the University of Arizona is supporting the scientists, which is fantastic, but we're monitoring the situation to see if we need to step in. Okay, and the scientists we're talking about are uh, Overpeck and Hughes, is that yeah. right? Yeah, so Malcolm Hughes, um, he was part of the so-called hockey stick graph, um, and e and &E has gone over to the other authors in this graph, Michael Mann, who I mentioned before, and also Ray Bradley. And then Jonathan Overpeck, they were interested in because of his work on the UN IPCC reports. They say he's an agent of the UN, and, um, you know, we need to see what he's up to, and e, &E Legal has contested the, um, the scientific consensus on climate change, and so any scientist they view as a figurehead for this, they've gone after to try and poke holes, to embarrass, to humiliate. It's really a terrible, terrible situation. There's a blob that has eaten environmentalism, and it's the climate movement. It's the all-encompassing excuse for whatever bothers you. What bothers you? I've got just the thing. It's energy rationing, though I'm not going to sell it as energy rationing. But it's sort of the brass ring for the movement. They do say in their briefs, I remember this very clearly, they say, you know, we're actually looking for things to, uh, to embarrass them. Um, I went and attended the hearing in Arizona in February, and they, they actually called it a fishing expedition, saying that they were looking for things to... Um, to impugn them with. Or how to go fishing. I mean, they're very upfront, actually, about their motives. It's quite interesting. Is this is this Chris Horner? 
Um, Chris Horner is part of this group. The attorney who was arguing in Arizona was David Schneer. I think he's the director of Uni Legal. Oh, okay. All right. And and both of those gentlemen were involved in the University of Virginia yes. case yes. where the university there won mm -hmm. at the Virginia Supreme Court. Yes. Uh, uh, the, the court threw out the E&E &E arguments with some prejudice, as I recall. Of course, the University of Virginia to pay $600,000 defending itself. It's been called Cuccinelli's Witch Hunt. Designed to intimidate and suppress. Yes. Yes, no, they, they didn't get anywhere in Virginia, so now they're trying with their hand at Arizona. Um, and in fact, they have continued to submit open records requests even after this hearing. They submitted an open record request as late as the end of February, I believe. So an open records request, that means to the scientists, they want all your emails. Yeah, it depends on how it's, depends how it's formulated, but their open records requests are very broad. So like I said, um, the ones that were at litigation in this particular case were huge swaths of emails going back to the late 90s, um, all correspondence with dozens and dozens of people. I mean, it was really quite enormous. I think, I don't remember exactly how many pages it was, but it was somewhere in the hundreds of thousands. Right. So what is the irony of these kind of open records laws, sunshine laws, right? Yeah, being being used in this way. I mean, it's a co it's a complicated issue because at the heart, the open records laws are designed to give American taxpayers a view into how their government is operating, and I think it's a very noble law that um, you know it's it's to provide transparency and government accountability. But uh, groups like E&E Legal are really taking it outside of its intended purpose and using it to argue that not only are government scientists, government um, public servants. They're using um, the open records laws, which were created in the 1960s and 70s, to go after emails, which weren't even, you know, an idea then. And they're they're really taking this outside of what these were um, formulated for in the 60s and 70s, and they're using it really to harass and bully scientists. Right. So these were originally designed to open up uh, formally uh, closed or, or difficult access meetings of public yeah. officials. Yeah, and, and they're designed to, like I said, create transparency in how government decisions are made. And, you know, I could see how that could apply for government scientists, but the way that e, &E Legal is using it is really just so far beyond that. It's, I think it's a very clear line, actually. In the right. Sense. They just want to vacuum up everything and then, and then, yes. and then pull out words, as we've seen. Yes, I think vacuum up is a, is a great way to describe it. And, and a part of this vacuuming up process for them is to waste the scientists' time in, in, in pulling all these records. I mean, the, the interesting thing about Arizona is, in Arizona, the scientists are considered the custodians of the records instead of the university itself. And so the scientists themselves were responsible for compiling all this information. And like I said, that took them weeks and weeks. What about the vulnerability of young scientists to these kind of uh, uh, attacks? I mean, I think it's a risk. Um, I think groups like E&E, they like to go after the, um, the more prominent scientists because their theory is, you know, if you take down the biggest one, then you've really created a domino effect. In fact, Michael Mann has written about this. He calls it the Serengeti strategy, where he's likened it to picking off one zebra out of the herd using your combined resources just to, to get one instead of um, going broadly for the whole herd. Um, so I think younger scientists, in a way, are safer just because they may not be um, quite as prominent. But it is definitely a risk. Um, I've heard of uh, younger scientists at least getting things like harassing emails, which is really unfortunate. And you know, to the extent that any of them are facing this, I encourage them to reach out to us, the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund.